Standing on the platform of truth. Pioneer Health and Missions. Our dear, most kind and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you, Jehovah, for bringing us here safely. We ask, dear Father, that we may hear your words and your words alone this morning. I pray that you may bestow a blessing upon the hearing and the reading of your word, and that we can embrace the truths that are found therein, and that we can walk in them. We thank you, and we ask you these things in Jesus' name, your Son. Amen. Blessed Sabbath to every single one of you this morning. The message of today is... Uh, the second angel's message. And I'm sure that many of you are familiar with this message. And our opening scripture is found in Revelation 14, verse 8, which reads, And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So Babylon, the great city, has what, according to this passage? Has fallen. Because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Babylon, we understand this name derives, derives from the Tower of Babel, which means what? Confusion. Before I continue this morning, I must say that the three angels' messages that we read about in the book of Revelation are not literal angels flying in the midst of heaven. These are a symbol of a people, a movement. Would you agree? And they are a movement upon the earth with a specific message to bear to his inhabitants. So I will ask you the following question. Would you like to belong to this movement? Amen. Notice that this movement is active in taking this message to the earth's inhabitants. While it is true that this message will be heard in this house of worship this morning, those outside this house of worship must also hear this message. But in order for them to hear this message, what must the messenger do? Sure. Take or deliver this message. Amen. Unfortunately, many will not want to come here. But by God's grace, we can go to them. Now, if they reject the message, that's on them. Whether they hear or forbear, we must take this message. Will you agree? Yes. The following statement is taken from the book, one of my favorite books, Daniel and the Revelation, which means each of these three angels symbolizes a body of religious teachers who are commissioned to make known to their fellow man the special truths which constitute the burden of these messages respectively. So again, these Angels symbolize a body, according to Daniel and the Revelation, a body of religious what? So in order for me to belong to this body, I must be what? A Bible teacher. Well, many of you shrink at the thought of teaching Bible teachings. But I want to encourage you this morning, and I have two scriptures to share uh, before we continue. And one of them is found in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. For when by reason of, of the time, ye ought to be what? Ye have need again that some, of, some one teach you the rudiments of the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of solid food. So... 
For when by reason of what? The time, ye ought to be what? Teachers. Because we are children of the light and recognize the time, we should be found teaching others the message. Do we recognize the time that we are living in, first of all? And if we recognize that time, then we must be teaching the word of God to others. The next verse is found in Daniel chapter 12, verse 3, which reads, And they that be wise shall, be, shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, firmament. And they that turn many to what? Righteousness as the stars forever and ever. So it is our responsibility to turn many to what? Righteousness. And if we are found doing this, then we are as the stars forever and ever. In other words, you are an illuminator. And God's glory through you will cover the earth. We know that in Revelation chapter 18, we read about a movement, another angel, which lightens the earth with what? His glory. His glory. And that glory doesn't pertain to me or to you. It's the glory of God, his character shining through you as you share the wonderful truths of God's word, his marvelous light. The second angel's message is an earthwide message. Yes, we are here in Orosi, California. But there are other believers scattered around the world, and they too have the responsibility to share this message. The announcement is given, Babylon the Great has fallen, has fallen. This message is an event that we can see, similar to, to what those living in Noah's day saw in the marching together of, the, of God's creation to aboard the ark. Was that something visible? Yes. In the summer of 1844, this message was first given. And what happened then? The message arousing thousands to abandon their churches. Why? Why did the, this message, the second angel's message, arouse people to abandon their churches? Because these churches had rejected the first angel's message. And so loyal ones who pertain to these churches heard the call and abandon these fallen churches. That was a visible demonstration as well. Now the question, well, we kind of answered it already, but what, is, what led to her fall? And we said her disregard and reject, rejection of the first message. Obedience, I would like to, to say, is the highest type of worship one can render to his creator, obedience. Notice the following passage. And Samuel said, Had Jehovah as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of Jehovah? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. Hearken, what does hearken mean? To listen. To pay attention to, to heed. Thank you. First Samuel 15, 22. Notice the following. To do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to Jehovah than sacrifice. And to do is to act, correct? Not just to hear and not do or not act out. The next passage is found in Revelation 18, verse 2. And he cried with a mighty, mighty voice, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, and has become a habitation of demons, and a hold of every unclean spirit, and a hold of every unclean and hateful bird. This is, I find this pretty profound. The habitation of Babylon the great has, uh, has become the habitation of what? Demons. demons. Has this ever dawned on you? I w I've, in the past, when I just started to, 
to come into the truths of God's word. I had few uh, acquaintance that belonged to other churches. And um, they would visit me. Um, they would ask me to go with him. They would invite me to go to their meetings. Um, one of them belonged to a, a particular church. I won't say the name of it. But I, I believe I went once or twice, perhaps. But I was not aware of what the Bible declares of these fallen churches. Knowingly, would you want to go to a church that's inhabited by demons? No. And yet, many of our ministers are inviting publicly for us to attend these churches. Amazing. It's not only a habitation of demons, but a hold of every unclean spirit. Because she has rejected the true message, Babylon the Great again has fallen and has become the habitation of demons. Notice what 1 Timothy chapter 4, 1 reads. But the Spirit said expressly that in the latter times some shall fall away from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of what? Doctrines of demons. So the spirit, the spirit of the truth says that in the latter times, many shall fall away from the faith, from the truth. Notice that this class gives heed, pays attention to these misleading spirits. My question is, why give heed to teachings of demons? Why do we pay attention to such teachings? Why do the majority of people pay attention or heed these teachings? Lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge. I found two reasons, and I'm sure there's more. And one is found at 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. Notice what it says. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be what? False teachers, false teachers among you who privately shall bring him damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. So one reason is what? False what? Teachers, Teachers among the flock of God. That's one reason. But if we are familiar with the truth, we should have no desire to want to listen to a false teacher, correct? Correct. But notice the other answer that's given in Scripture. For the time will come when they will not endure what? Wow. Sound doctrine or wholesome teaching. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having what? Each in ears. ears. Having each in ears is a desire to be, to be told that which one desires to hear. In other words, nothing that brings me discomfort and moves me from my comfort zone. I want to I wanna hear that which makes me feel at peace or makes me feel that I'm okay. Is the Bible a buffet? No, it's not. I remember... I was traveling with a friend. This is years ago. I was not baptized in the Adventist church yet. And this person turned to me and said, why do you make such a big deal over the Sabbath? Why is there such a big deal over the Sabbath? And I turned around. I know God had placed these thoughts in my mind because I, I would have not known how to answer that. But I turned around and, and looked at this person and said, well, why would God make such a big deal over a tree, over the fruit of a tree? And the person looked at me and, what are you talking about? Well, it was because one tree was touched, the fruit of it was touched and eaten. 
Look where we're at. What's the big, what's the big deal of a fruit of a tree? The person stood quiet and said, the big deal is because God said it. And we are to obey him. That's the big deal. So if God has said that he has blessed and sanctified the Sabbath, then that's what he said, and that's what we must do. Simple as that. But to many, it doesn't make any difference, unfortunately. And I hate to tell you, but religion today hasn't changed. It has become something you can choose according to your own liking rather than according to what the Bible says. You can have, you choose a church that you like. If you're an Adventist, choose a church, a group, a sect that you like. Isn't that so? And that's why there's sex among Adventism, which is a sad truth. One, another example that comes to mind is um, I hark on this because I believe it's important, and that's personal appearance. Um, modern preachers of today, most of the time they wear what? Jeans, T-shirts, because it doesn't matter to them. Or perhaps, let me be softer, they might be ignorant about what the Bible says. We need to consult Scripture if the God of Scripture is indeed our God. There's principles in Scripture that touch on our appearance when ministering before Him. He made... Um, he had... He had certain garments made for his priest. And these were for glory and beauty or for honor. To minister before him and his people. But today the masses, they don't care. And so they place themselves above scripture. Music is another thing. These are small things to many, insignificant. It doesn't matter what you dress, what you wear, what you eat. Well, it matters to my God. If it didn't matter to him, I wouldn't find it in Scripture. None of the prophets would have penned such an insignificant thing. And if we go to the spirit of prophecy, well, it's even more clear there. But I think you guys get what I'm trying to convey, correct? So these people have itching ears. They want to hear what they want to hear. This class, Isaiah talks about this class in my understanding. And in that day, seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, We will eat our what? our own bread, and wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. Just let us be called by your name. But we eat what we want to eat. Spiritually speaking, and we will wear what we want to wear. Should we have this attitude? No, I've done so many things out of lack of knowledge, out of ignorance. But during the times of ignorance, the Bible says that God what? Winks. But when we come to the light, and we should embrace the light, what do you say? And they that shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto what? Fables. There's a Spanish saying, truth does not sin, 
but it brings discomfort. You can and will, unfortunately, lose friends. Numbers will quickly begin to shrink and become small when you stand and teach truth. It's unfortunate, but it's a reality. However, I have good news for you, or the Bible does. God has won or has always won battles with only a small number. And in fact, this is all he needs is a small, loyal number. That's all he needs. He doesn't need the masses. He doesn't need the millions in Adventism. He only needs a small, loyal few. And those will finish the work. That's all he needs. And we're being distracted. We're being distracted in so many different ways from what we need to be doing. There are only two spirits in the world. Would you agree? There's only two spirits in the world, the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. And we decide which one we will follow. We should not expect, expect large numbers of people to unite with the truth. Hit, history testifies to this fact. How many entered into the uh, Noah's Ark? How many entered into the promised land? How many proved faithful after Jesus was uh, taken by the Romans? It's always been a few, num a few in number, according to the Bible. It's never been the masses. And today, everyone is joining bands and coming together and falling under one spirit or the other. It is difficult to be misled when we do what God says in his word. Is it possible to know the truth and be under the wrong spirit? Yes. How do I know? Satan knows the truth far better than I know it, far better than you know it. But does he possess the spirit of truth? No. So intellectually knowing truth is not enough if the truth doesn't possess our heart. And all that dwell on the earth shall worship him. Finally, after the second angel goes out, and everyone whose name had not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb that had been slain. Revelation 13.8. And we read the following. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything unclean, or he that makes an abomination and, and, and a lie. Only they that are written in the Lamb's book of life will enter. I would like to share some testimonials of the condition of the churches when this message was first given in 1844, but also some years after. And these quotations are taken again from Daniel and the Revelation. Notice, Professor Finney, or Finney, editor of the Oberlin Evangelist in February 1844 said, we have had the facts before our minds that, in general, the Protestant churches of our country, as such, were either apathetic or hostile to nearly all the moral reforms of the age. They are partial exceptions, yet not enough to render the fact otherwise than general. We have also another corroborative fact, the almost universal absence of revival influence in the churches. The spiritual apathy is almost all-pervading and is fearfully deep. So the religious press of the whole land testifies. Very extensively, church members are becoming devotees of what? Fashion. 
joining hands with the ungodly in parties of pleasure, and dancing, and festivities, etc. But we need not expand this painful subject. Suffice it that the evidence thickens and rolls heavily upon us to show that the churches generally are becoming sadly degenerate. They have gone very far from the Lord, and He has withdrawn Himself from them. This was in 1844. What can we say today? During the time of the great Irish revival of 1859, the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church of Ireland held its session in Belfast. Of a strange scene that occurred in that assembly, the Belfast News letter of September 30 said, Here in this venerable body of ministers and elders, we find two ministers openly giving each other the lie, and the whole General Assembly turn into a scene of confusion bordering upon a riot. What spirit was dwelling there? The spirit of truth? This is a sad and deplorable picture. And what has been the course of events and the tendency in the deportment of professed Christians since that time. There's considerable spasmodic action in some localities and much effort put forth by sensational revi revivalists to excite the emotions. But no permanent good seems to be accomplished and the standard of godli godliness sinks lower and lower. The New, Yorker, the New York Observer copied this with the following remarks. This is a copy of a handbill conspicuously posted in New Orleans at the present time. The church for which this splendid bar is to be open is called Christ's Church. But our private opinion is, if Christ attends the fair, he will come with a scourge of large cords and drive out every man and woman who dishonors his house and name with such things as these. Call it a church, if you will. But for Christ's sake, O oh New Orleans people, don't call it Christ's church. Anything but that. Pretty powerful. If Christ would come in, he would come in with, with what? With the scourge of large cords. Get these things what? Hence. That's one portion that we don't like. We, love, we, we, we like the loving side of the Christ, but we know that he is indignated when his house is not reverenced or his father's house is not reverenced or anything that pertains to his worship. We serve a jealous God, don't we? Yes, he's a loving God. We know that. But we should also know by the reading of his word that he is a jealous God. As an illustration of the effect of church lotteries, the watchman relates the following. A member of a church went to his pastor and entreated his personal interse intercession with his favorite son, who had become ru ruinously addicted to the vice of gambling. The pastor consented, and seeking the young man, found, in he found him in his chamber. He commenced his lecture, but before he concluded, the young man laid his hand upon his arm and drew his, uh, his attention to a pile of splendid volumes that stood upon the table. Well, said the young man, these volumes are won by me at a fair given in your church. They were my first venture. But for that lottery, under the patronage of a Christian church, I should never have become a what? A gambler. Where did this man become a gambler? A church. A lot of us would consider this practice 
innocent. But we don't really comprehend, we don't grasp how much things can affect someone's mind. It might not affect yours, but all minds are not created equal. We know that from the pen of inspiration. All minds are different. There are thousands of ministers, local and conference, and many thousands of the laity who are as dead and worthless as barren fig, fig trees. They contribute nothing of a temporal or spiritual nature to the progress and triumphs of the gospel throughout the earth. If all these dry bones in our church and its congregations could be resurrected and brought into requisition by faithful, active service, what new and glorious manifestations of divine power would break forth? The New York Independent of December 3, 1896, gave an article from D.L. Moody, from which the following is an extract. In a recent issue of your paper, I saw an article from a contributor which stated that there were over 3,000 churches in the congregational and Presbyterian bodies of this country that did not report a single member added by profession of faith last year. Can this be true? The thoughts has taken such hold of me that I can get it out of my mind. It is enough almost to send a thrill of horror through the soul of every Christian. Do we, does this bother us? Do you know what this statement is saying? What is it saying? Churches are dying because our members, we are growing old and dying. And so the, the doors of a building, of a house of worship, are what? Closing. Because soldiers are no longer soldiers. Can you imagine soldiers armed to the teeth and they don't fight? What kind of soldier is that? Would you want to be a part of that army? How rapidly you will be defeated, right? Being surrounded by soldiers that don't fight. Well, in a spiritual sense, if we're Christians, then that means that we're followers of who? And we ought to be doing what Christ did. And that's why people were labeled such. Because they went around, went around doing what Christ did. Seeking to save who? The lost. The second angel's message is addressed to those organizations where the people of God are mainly to be found, for they are specially addressed as being in Babylon, and at a certain time are cal called out. This is very important. L pay attention to this statement. The message applies to the present generation, and now God's people are to be looked for, certainly in the Protestant organizations of Christendom. But as these churches depart farther and farther from God, they at length reach such a condition that true Christians can no longer maintain a connection with them, and then they will be called out. This we look for in the future, in fulfillment of Revelation 18, 1 through 4. We believe it will come when, in addition to their corruptions, the churches begin to raise against the saints the hand of what? Oppression. So if Smith and those who co collaborated in putting together this book had any insight, then we can expect that this message would only gather force when this begins to take place. And I, I can say 
that to a certain extent it has begun to take place, right? The authorities in some cases are called. But perhaps um, here I will give my opinion. And you can take it or leave it. Um, I'm not too sure. We know that Christ attended the synagogues, correct? And by the scriptures, we find his conduct in the synagogues. He was also, it's obvious that he was asked to participate because he will take the podium or the platform and he would read from the scriptures and he would sit down, correct? The question is this, and many times he got into trouble for saying something that was not in accordance with, you know, the church. For saying something in the church that um, was not in harmony with how they viewed things. But should we, or my understanding is that, well, let me just share an experience that I had. And this is what, maybe five years ago, I would say, close to about five years ago. We attended a, a church. It was an Adventist church. And um, pretty, pretty big, large congregation. And it was me and two other brothers, spiritual brothers. And one of them got up, and um, I guess he went to go use the restroom. But he was taking quite some time. He, we were, I was there, and finally the other brother got up and left, and maybe 35, 40 minutes passed, and they were not coming. And I shouldn't laugh, because it's serious. Finally, someone came, if I could recall correctly, someone came and approached me and said, hey, um, they have such and such outside. Maybe you need to go out. I, I don't know what happened. I do now because they told me. But the brother that was with me, he uh, started a conversation with one of the brothers there. And one of those brothers that he was talking to, I believe he, no, I know he had a position in the church. So as he was giving ear to what the brother was telling him, after a short amount of time, he went and spoke to the elders and called a quick meeting with the pastor. Um, it got pretty bad. Um, the pastor literally, when I was outside talking to the church, the services had already ended. Um, they, they approached, as I, I went outside when they told me, and I didn't know where they were at. And when I was, um, what is it, um, saying my goodbyes to some of the brothers there, and just waiting for the two brothers that came with me to come, they finally came, and they looked pale. Their face, they looked like they had seen the devil, literally. And he says, we got to go. And I said, what happened? He says, we'll tell you in the car. We just got kicked out of here. And the brothers that were with, with me, that I was saying bye to, they were pretty shaken up. And they're like, what happened? I don't know. And I know the brothers that I was with, they're not, I know, I know them. They're not troublemakers. They were just in a conversation. And when we were driving away, they said, yeah. Um, the pastor came and asked us to leave. And he started saying some things about us and and I just started saying things in return, you know. Um, 
And it got pretty bad, and he said that we, we needed to get out. I think he insulted them, too. I don't recall what he told them. He said, why are you coming here to evangelize? Why are you coming here when you have the whole world? Go teach them their doctrine, your doctrine out there. This is my church. I, me personally, I don't like that type of um, encounters. I've experienced some. My heart begins to race. I get nervous. I, I don't like that feeling. When I have gone door to door and people reject me, they just say, oh, I don't got time, sorry. And I go on to the next one. What am I saying? I think we're wasting time debating with those that don't care to hear the truth. The Seventh-day Adventist Church has officially, officially rejected the first angel's message. Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. There are hungering and thirsting souls, not only in the churches of Christendom, but in the world, that need us to take this message. But perhaps, no, we're too busy. Wait. Let me finish quarreling with this brother. It's taking time, but I'll get him to see what I'm seeing. When I go back, that person is no longer there. They went to their grave without the possibility of receiving Christ. And without the hope of eternal life. The question is this. Will I give an account for that? Because I've spent hours and hours, days and days, quarreling with seven-day Adventists who don't care for truth. Let me bring it even, I think I've mentioned this before. Just so that I could bring it home a little stronger. I am sure that none of you here, that it would be a, the greatest challenge of your life to forgive someone who could have saved your child from drowning and they didn't do a thing to save your child. It would be a challenge for you to forgive such person. But the person will look at you, well, I was busy. You were present when my child was drowning. And you could have saved my child, and you did not. Do you think, or do we think, that the heart of our God feels any less? Do you think he doesn't care for the masses? If he didn't care, he would already have sent his son. But we read in the Bible that he is what? Long-suffering. Because he doesn't want what? Any to perish. We only have one responsibility, brothers and sisters, and that is to take this message to them. That's it. 
Whether they hear or forbear, that's not our responsibility. Do we understand that? We did our responsibility. We did what we needed to do. I long for the day where everyone joins together. And I'm not saying everyone in Adventism or among those who believe the one true God, because that's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. It's unfortunate, but it's not going to happen. But those that, the way I understand it, those that love truth and take the Bible and the testimonies for what they say will draw together. God will bring this about. Truth will unite them. And those who possess not the spirit of truth will eventually abandon that, the, that class because they have another spirit. This is a quote from Sister, Sister White. And every part of the land light was given upon the second angel's message. And every what? Part of the land. And that cry melted the hearts of thousands. It went from city to city. And from village to village. Until the waiting people of God were fully aroused. It went from city to city, from village to village, I would say from town to town. In many churches, the message was not permitted to be given. Isn't that taking place today? And a large company who had the living testimony left these fallen churches. A mighty work was accomplished by the midnight cry. The message was heart-searching, leading the believers to seek a living experience for themselves. They knew that they could not lean upon one another. What was this message about? A second angel's message. We need to call God's people to abandon, to come out of Babylon. And now, oftentimes, or before, I had this question, where am I going to take people? You never had that thought? Especially when you're part of the corporate church? As soon as they walk in, they're going to say, well, wait a minute, weren't you teaching me this? And look. But now all these uh, small congregations, missions and houses of worship, literal homes, for those who are listening, when this gets published, we are to be Bethel. What is Bethel? Bethel. What is Bethel? The house of what? Of God. We need to be a Bethel. We need God. We need Christ. Desperately. We need to finish the work. We do. And the work's going to get finished. With me or without me, the work is going to get done. Amen. I just want to be a part of that group. Amen. And I hope you do too. I hope you do too. So with that, um, I'm going to invite those that can once again to kneel with me to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for inviting us to be a part of that movement that will illuminate the world with your glory. 
And I pray that we can be part of it, and it is our choice. Please help us, dear Father. Help us to be faithful. Help us to be loyal to your word. Help us to display your character. Help us even to love our enemies. For when we display your character, we will draw people to you. Please be with us throughout this rest of this Holy Sabbath. Help us to remember that it is holy because you have pronounced it so. And please be with our conversations as we converse with one with another. We thank you and we ask these things in the name of your begotten Son, Christ Jesus. Amen. Standing on the Platform of Truth. Pioneer.